Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I guess I didn't tell it to my dad yet, but definitely grew up with a very good dad. Thankful for all the things we did growing up. You know, I used to play baseball. He'd get down on his knees and try to catch the baseball I'd throw at him, and he hurt. I feel like he hurt his hand and everything, but you know, I definitely appreciate him for all that he did for me growing up. And thank you for all the fathers out there. I have a good uncle and a good grandpa. He's not here today, but definitely blessed in this congregation. Good, good father. Uh, so today we're not going to talk about fathers. Uh, it's kind of unrelated, but we're talking about a relationship to our heavenly father. And the question for us today, and it's, there's really only one person in your life that can answer this question, and it's you. Are you really following God? Or are you just claiming to follow God? My message in this lesson is that by simply claiming, by making the assertion that I am a follower of my Heavenly Father, that doesn't actually mean that you are. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so just because we make the claim to be a follower of God does not mean that we are necessarily following God just because we make the claim. But we actually have to make sure we're doing the will of the Father. Now I can claim many, many things in this life. I can make the assertion and claim I am the president of of the United States. I could go walk around all the time saying that and telling people I'm the president. But does that make it true? Absolutely not. Just because you claim something doesn't make it true. And so my encouragement to us is if we're going to make the claim, if we're going to wear the name, if we're going to hold on to that title and say, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. Now we actually need to be true followers of Christ and not just proclaiming we are. So I, I want you to look at how authentic your Christian walk really is. Is it fake? Is it true? Is it real? Is it genuine and sincere? Or do you put up a front when you're around your Christian brothers or friends? And I, I think we've all can, can have gotten into maybe little cycles of that in our life where we feel like we've lived one way the week before and then we come to services and it's like, oh, you know, I wasn't living it as a, as a true Christian this past week. So I want each of us to look into each of your own personal lives. And you're the only one that can do it. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, or if you want to be my follower, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Right? We learn a lot of important lessons in this scripture right here that you know, being a true follower of Christ involves much more than just making the claim. Saying the words, I am a Christian, I believe. But true Christianity involves denying yourself the life that you would like to live and submitting, therefore, to the life of God that He has given you. For us to live. You are not your own. You understand? And you were bought with a price. First Corinthians <laughs> chapter 6 teaches that. Verses 19 and 20, Paul writes to the Christians, he says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You, are, you don't belong to yourself anymore. When you, when you sign up for that salvation, you're not your own. Verse 20 says, For you were bought with a price. He paid for you. You are now His. As, as if a slave owner were to buy a slave. You were bought with that price. Now you are His. It says, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Right? That body that you think is hosting your spirit, neither one of those things belong to you anymore. And when you decide that you want to accept Christ's salvation by believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized... The freedom that you receive from your sins comes at a price. Right? Salvation is free for the taking, but it's by no means cheap. And we have to understand that. You must give yourself to Christ's cause if you really want to be a true follower of Him. You have to give yourself. 
not just making a claim because you're no longer your own. So you sign up to be a worker. I think the, the religious world doesn't like that. Concept. You, you're signing up to do something, to work, and to put in work. You become a soldier. You become a servant, and you become a slave. The religious world doesn't like to hear that at all about Christianity, but Romans chapter 6 and verse 18 talks about how we are, we are slaves of righteousness when we have put away the works of the flesh. So we must never sign up for this salvation if we're not willing to do the will of the Father, to do the things that's been given to us to do. And though, because the Lord is not interested in lip service, just claiming, I'm following you, Lord. You know, the journey to heaven is described in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14. The religious world acts like it's so, all you got to do is say the name and then you punch your ticket and you're there. Listen to Jesus' words. It says, narrow is the gate. And what? Difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Right? That means it's going to be hard. It's going to be a difficult thing to be a follower of me, Jesus said. So, in, in, in following Christ involves more than just making a claim, but it involves actually following through with the work that He's given us to do. If you go over to the book of James, James gives a comparison in uh, chapter 2, a comparison of the Christian life without doing any work. Right? Someone who claims the faith, they, they claim, I have such confidence in God, but they don't actually follow through with the Lord's commandments, and they don't have obedience. In James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, he says, What does it profit, my brethren? Right, what good does it do? If someone says, right, there's the claim, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? What's the indicated answer there? No. And then he gives this example, verses 15 and following. He says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Right, so here's your words. If someone's in need, de depart. Be, depart in peace. Be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Right, what good does it do? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Right, so do you get James' comparison here? I want to draw this out a little bit. He's talking about someone who claims what they don't do. Right, someone who says they're going to do something, but they don't follow through with what they said. And that's what we're, when we become a Christian, we are, we are saying, I am going to follow you. So imagine that you are that person in this passage who is the one that needs the help. Right, we've all found ourselves in bad situations where we need somebody to help us. Let's say that you are poor, you find yourself without money, and you need clothes, you only have one pair of clothing. You're hungry. You need food, and you're just in desperate need of somebody to help you. And then someone comes along, and they say, they say I'm going to help you. You know, first off, that is such a relief. You know, someone says, I'm, I'm going to feed you, and I'm going to provide you with clothing. I'm going to give you somewhere that you can sleep. And that, if you didn't have those things, that would be the greatest news that you had heard for a long time. And they make claim after claim of all the things they're going to do for you, but then... They do not. Right? They say they're going to bless you with all of these things and give you these things, but they don't follow through. How are you going to feel about that person who made all those promises to you? Are you going to be happy with them? Are you going to be pleased with them for saying that they were going to help you, but then not helping you? you know, I'd rather them have not said they were going to help me if they really weren't going to do it. And I really believe that's the way God feels about this whole thing as well. And so what James is getting at is that God is not pleased. If we make the claim to have faith in Him, right? if we say we're going to follow Him, but we don't actually follow through and do the will, He's looking for obedience, He's looking for true disciples and followers of Him. That's why He says in verse 17, that's also faith by itself. If you just believe, it, it's not enough. If it does not have works, it's dead. Right, we actually have to do the will of the Father. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does. And right, we have the truth here. We're happy. We're so lucky to have the truth. But we need to make sure we're actually living it. And doing it every day and, and studying it and understanding.
and understanding that that's our life. And we've given our life to it. And we're not our own anymore. So I ask you this hour in this lesson, if you really have been living the life of a true disciple, if you've really been living what God called you to live, or are you just wearing the name? You know, there's great privileges that it seems to take us in this life when we come here and we wear the name of Christ, but are you actually doing what you're supposed to do? I have three points in this lesson. Number one, I want to give you an example in the Old Testament. An Old Testament king of Judah who claimed to follow God, but he actually did not. And we're going to look into that. And secondly, I want to give some New Testament examples of some individuals who make a claim that they're following God, but they're not. And then lastly, I want to just ask us some questions of application and have you look at your own personal life to make sure that our faith is genuine, to make sure that we're, we're not putting a, sh a show on or this isn't an act, this is real. We're actually Christians. We're not just saying we're Christians. So let's go to point number one. An Old Testament king of Judah who claimed to follow God, he did not. Our text, uh, if you would like to turn there, is 2 Chronicles chapter 13, and we're talking about someone named King Abijah. Now, he was the son of Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, son of David, right? So Abijah is David's great-great-grandson. So he's the second king to rule over Judah after the split. It was Rehoboam was the first one, and then it was um, King Abijah was next in line. So when you're reading uh, through... And reading about these kings, you go through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. A lot of times, when it talks about a king, you come to a statement in the chapter, and it's kind of a summary statement about that individual's life. And it'll say, "And King so and so did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and kept his statutes, and did not depart from all the commandments that the Lord had given him all the days of his life." And we can read some of those statements, not, not as many as we, we would like to. But then you'll see the other side of the coin is some bad kings. You'll read it says, And king so-and-so did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the evil ways of his father. But I was reading this chapter in 2 Chronicles chapter 13 as part of my nightly reading, and I was reading about King Abijah. And I, I have my little list of all the good kings and all the bad kings, and I was looking for one of these statements. I was looking for a summary statement in this chapter, but I couldn't find it. And he's on the list of bad kings. And I read this chapter and say he doesn't sound like such a bad guy. And so I want to point out that there is a summary statement that we're going to look at in 1 Kings chapter 15, but we're going to hold that thought. First, I want to read from 2 Chronicles chapter 13. And we're going to see that Abijah seems to be very faithful in this chapter. And he makes some great claims in, about following God, and that he is faithful to the Lord. It convinced me. And then I looked at my list again, and I said, okay, I've got to find this out. And then I went over to 1 Kings chapter 15. So, look, we're, we're going to start by looking in this chapter. So, verse 1, 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Starting in verse 1, it says, In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Right, he was the king of the, of the northern ten tribes of Israel. It says, during his 18th year, King Abijah, or Abijah became king over Judah, right, the southern two kingdoms. And he reigned for three years in Jerusalem. Very short reign. It says, and there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam, the kings of the two nations. Uh, Abijah uh, set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, mighty men of battle. And so these two kings, they're going to about to go into war with each other. The ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes are going to, they're going to fight in this section. And as this battle is about to take place, King Abijah, the text says, stands up before the armies of Jeroboam and addresses the whole crowd. And we have his speech written down in this chapter and what he says and the words and the claims that he makes. And his in his speech uh, to King Jeroboam and the ten army or the, the armies of the ten northern tribes, he begins to call them out for their rebellion against God. 
So imagine that. He's one man standing before that whole nation in Jeroboam, and he starts calling them out for their sins against the Lord. And isn't that right? Scripture tells us all of the many wicked things that King Jeroboam led Israel into doing those ten northern tribes. And Abijah is calling him out for forsaking the Lord. Verse 5, he says to them, Should you not have known that the Lord God of Israel gave dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons by a covenant of Saul? Yet Jeroboam, right, your king, the son of Nebet, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord, right? Your king rebelled against the seeds of David and God's promises. Skip down to verse 8, what, what the Bible continues to say. It says, And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hands of the sons of David, and you are a great multitude. And with you are the gold calves which Jeroboam made for you as God. Right? You have the golden calves on your side that Jeroboam made for you. We have the real God. In verse 9, he continues to point out more of their sins against the Lord. And then you come to verse 10. It says, but as for us, and listen to his claims and his words. He says, as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. That's a big claim. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites attend to their duties, and they burn to the Lord every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices of sweet incense. What's he saying? We're still doing things God's way. You're not. You've <coughs> forsaken the way. He talks about the sons of Aaron. They also set the showbread in order on the pure gold table and the lampstand of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. And he says, for we keep the command of the Lord, our God, but you have forsaken him. And then to conclude his speech, he says in verse 12, now look, God himself is with us as our head. That's a great statement. God himself is with us as our head and his priests with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you, O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. All right, and that's the conclusion of his speech. It sounds like a great speech, and maybe it was authentic that day. The rest of the chapter actually tells about how those armies of King Abijah was granted a great victory over Jeroboam and the ten northern tribes army that day. Verses 17 and 18 says, Then Abijah... And his people struck them with a great slaughter. So 500,000 choice men of Israel fell, slain. Thus the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed, because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. Now I like that story. And let me just ask you, according to that chapter, that's all that we have about King Abijah in Scripture. What list do you think he would be on? The good kings or the bad kings? I would say probably good by the sounds of the chapter. You know, think of all the bold things that he said with his words to Jeroboam that day. He says, you have forsaken the Lord, but we have not. We have not forsaken him. In verse 12, he said, God himself is our, with us. He is our head. O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers. You shall not prosper. It sounds like a faithful king to me. Sounds like a good king, but what's very interesting is the summary statement that we read about him in 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. And it makes it sound like we're missing something uh, of you know, the details of King Abijah's life or some of the events or whatever happened about his faithfulness to God. That he wasn't as faithful as he seemed on that day in 2 Chronicles chapter 13. So verse 1 of the parallel account says... In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, Abijah became king over Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem for three years. Right? Let's talk about the same king. Verse 3 says, And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So you see the contrast here? I don't know about you, but I find those two sections of Scripture very interesting. We read in 2 Chronicles 13 of that great victory that Abijah had over Jeroboam and his armies, and all those statements of, of faith that you are my God, he is the head of us. 
And we have not forsaken him. But then you come over to 1 Kings 15 and it says, He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. Even though King Abijah made some great claims about his faithfulness to the Lord, something in Abijah's life made the Lord think otherwise. And he wasn't truly faithful to the Lord, whatever it was. And he wasn't going to hide anything from the Lord. You know, I would have said, well, yes, he's a good king. But he didn't hide whatever it was. He didn't hide it from the Lord. You know, maybe Abijah had been faithful to God, but then he stopped being faithful. So he made the claim, and then he stopped. Maybe the Lord knew his heart all along, that he was put up front the whole time. But the point stands. It's not enough to claim faithfulness. You actually have to do it. You have to live it. So it's not only about talking the talk, but it's also about continuing to walk the walk and follow his ways truly. And something about King Abijah's life was not pleasing to the Lord because the text says he walked in all the sins of his father. Now, here's a good question for us. What summary statement would God make of your life if you were to die right now? Sometimes I read these statements and it just makes my heart feel so good when I can read of Asa or Jehoshaphat and some of these great kings, Josiah, and they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. They never departed from the Lord's commandments all the days of their life. You know, what, what would God be able to say about you? Could it be written about you? And Wayne Anderson did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He did not depart from any of the Lord's commandments all the days of his life, but he kept the statutes of the Lord. Or would the Lord write about you? He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before, and his heart was not loyal. All right, so my question is, are you really following God? And you honestly say you are, or are you just making a claim? Secondly, let's talk about the New Testament, a few New Testament examples. Can you think of any individuals in the New Testament who made great claims about being followers of God, but they actually weren't? Who's probably the first group that comes to our mind? Pharisees, the scribes of the first century. Right, Jesus had many run-ins with these religious boasters in the first century. Their claim was that they were holy. Right? And they looked to everybody to be holy. Godly men. Righteous. Look, look at these righteous individuals. But the Bible says that that couldn't be farther from the truth. In Matthew chapter 15, listen to what Jesus says about the scribes and Pharisees on this occasion. Verses 6 to 9. says, thus, or th thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, he calls them. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, they're not teaching the commandments of the Lord their God. They're not actually doing, but they're just claiming. So these scribes and Pharisees in the first century, Jesus always called what? Hypocrites. Hypocrites, you would call them, because they would say one thing and make that claim, but then they would do another. They would, they would make great claims of being followers of God, and then they, they probably fooled a lot of the people, but the Bible says that, you know, the Bible says that God looks on the out, does not look on the outward appearance of man, but he looks on the heart. So if you, if you think you're going to be like the Pharisees and trick trick the Lord and you know, say, I'm holy, but I'm really not acting holy. I'm really not living holy. You're only fooling yourself because you're not going to fool God. And what's interesting about the Greek word um, hypocrite, and I, I did a little study of that, of that word, is, is defined in the Greek like this. It is one who is a pretender or a stage player. And the idea behind this word is someone who pretends to be someone else, like an actor on stage. Right? When an actor gets up on the stage, they put on a costume or a mask and pretend to be somebody that they're not. And that's what a hypocrite is. Right? These Pharisees, that's what Jesus is saying about them and what they were really doing in their lives. Was that they were being pretenders to be followers of God, but they were not really followers of God. 
making the claims with their mouth, right? Saying all the words like they really are followers of God, honoring Him with their lips. But they were not truly doing the will of the Father, but only pretending. They weren't truly keeping His commandments. And they really didn't want to follow God. They just wanted to look like they were following God so that they could be seen as holy and get the praise from men. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus says to His followers, He says, when you pray... You shall not be like the hypocrites, right? like the pretenders, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. So the church, I say to you, they have their reward. That's the reward right there. They, they are seen by men and the men look at them. There's your reward. But he says, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, Pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So we have to understand that God sees right through a pretender. Someone who is, claims Christianity, but they are not true. It is not genuine. These Pharisees always went about their communities trying to be seen by men. And everyone could see them standing on the street corners and in the synagogues daily praying, dressed like a priest. Listen to Matthew chapter 23, what Jesus says about them in verses 2 to 7. It says, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Right? They're saying the right things, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Right? So... Do what they're telling you to do, but don't follow their example because they're not living it. That's what Jesus is saying. They teach from the law. They know the law. And they can show you what the law says, and they understand it very well, and they claim that they're followers of it, but they're not. And we have to be careful that that isn't us in the church of Christ. We are blessed to know the truth. And we know God's law more than the religious bodies out there. But we understand that. But we have to make sure that we don't fall into this. That we don't fall into hypocrisy. Verse 5, he says about them, he says, But all their works they do to be seen by men. And they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Right there, their little outfits, they puff it out so that they can be seen by everyone. They love the best seats at the feast, the best uh, seats in the synagogue, the greetings in the marketplace to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Right, they love that. That they were seen by men. But God sees right through a pretender. And He sees through us if we try to pretend to keep the faith, but really are not. And my warning to each one of us is to not be caught up in any kind of hypocrisy. Be careful. You know, teaching one thing, believing it, but then doing another. You know, we could, you know, I think everybody in here would pass any Bible test that I could give you, but are we actually living it? That's the question. If I give you a list of actions that would be put on, here's the list that would be right things and wrong things. I think we'd all get it right, but would we get it right if we put the application? Are you actually doing that in your life? When you know, we speak out against sin and how bad it is here, when we're here in the assembly and we talk about how bad this country is and then we go out and maybe do the same things that we condemn with our mouth. We need to be very careful that our faith and our life is authentic and it's not fake. When we, you know, we've been blessed in the church to know the law, let's not waste our time by not living it. You know, so if, if we're here and if we call ourselves Christians, then why not be a true Christian and seek to have no hypocrisy in our life? You know, it is, it's easy in the church to get caught up living two different lives, claiming and professing righteousness on Sundays, but then living something else throughout the week. It's a hard thing to do. It's not just a Sunday religion. In Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul warns Titus about certain individuals who had their minds and their conscience defiled. Right, they went against their own conscience. And it says that they profess to know God. Right, they make that claim, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified from every good work. 
You know, that right there is the definition of hypocrisy, isn't it? They profess to know God, they make the claim, they declare it to be true, but in works, they deny it. Right? We know the truth. Let's live it. You know, he says they, they, they are abominable, they are disobedient and disqualified. You see, it is possible to profess Christianity and fall short of it. It says that they defiled their minds and they went against their own conscience. Right? Do you go against your conscience? What you know is wrong? And that means that that's exactly what they did, is they went against what they knew was, was right, and they, they did otherwise. So this verse teaches that if we are disobedient, we will be disqualified. Paul said about himself, you know, the great apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified, or a castaway, the King James Version translates it. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, he says, Therefore, this is good advice, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You know, Paul is saying, here's what I do with my life, and he's encouraging us to do it. Take a look at your life all the time. Make sure that you are not disqualifying yourself from the faith. In 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 1 and 1 to 1, sorry, 2 Timothy 1, 5, Paul commends and it encourages Timothy about his unfeigned faith that Timothy has in his heart. And that word unfeigned, I, I it didn't really stick out to me. I didn't really know what it meant. But it literally means to be unpretended. It's not fake. Right? That, that means that he, Timothy was going about his Christian life not faking it. But it was real. It was authentic. It was genuine. And it was sincere. The life that he was living. He was not pretending to do the Lord's work, but he was really and actually living and doing the Lord's work. He was not pretending. May we all strive for the same thing. That our faith is not pretended, but it's real. Joshua 24, verse 14 in the Old Testament says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth. That was a real and true heart. So God is looking to see if our service to Him is actually sincere. You know, we can go through the motions, we can do the right things, but are we actually true and sincere in what we do? Or are we just giving lip service? Now, 1 John 2, verse 9, shows us that it is possible to claim godliness, but then to live in darkness. So we can make the claim, but be doing something else. It says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Right, that means that I can claim I'm, I'm, I'm in the light. I'm living faithfully. I'm here, here's where I am. If I were to die, I'd be saved. But guess what? You're wrong. Because if you hate your brother, you can say one thing, but God knows you're true. So we can't hide. Be certain about your own salvation. So those are our New Testament examples. So we talked about King Abijah in the Old Testament. We talked about the Pharisees and some of the things, the warnings that were given. Now I just have a few questions for us. Think about your own life. Is your Christian walk real? Or are you just claiming faithfulness? Are you just using that name, Church of Christ, to see if you can get yourself to heaven the easy way? Or are you really following Christ? Here's some, here's some questions. Do you continue to commit actions that you know are wrong? Right? We can't continue in them if we know they're wrong. Do you come here to worship and feel like you've just been pretending all week and you just feel like it? If you feel it, it might be fine. And I don't claim to know anybody's heart in here, but I, I, just, I, I know you know your own. Number three, how is your dedication to the study of God's Word? Because if you don't know God's law, if you aren't, if you aren't continuing to let it prick your heart, then you can't follow it the way you need to. Are we studying with diligence as we're commanded, 2 Timothy 2.15? How well are you applying that law to your life? Are you giving attention to all of the Lord's commandments that you know are right, or just most of them? I wrote down James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble at one point, he is guilty of all. You are a transgressor, transgressor of the law. Right? So we might know, I'm living 90% right, but I don't give attention to this law. 
Because that's, that's my difficulty. That's the one I don't want to obey. So I'm going to obey 99% of Christ's command, but I'm going to neglect the one. You're living in darkness. We have to make the attempt. We don't have to be perfect, but we have to make the attempt at 100% of the Lord's commandments in order to be counted faithful. Are you giving attention to all of His commandments? How about this? Have you been attempting to follow the command to reach the lost? Following that great commission to preach the gospel to every creature, we need to have it on our thoughts. Make sure we're doing it. And so I'll close with this, and my encouragement is simple. Make sure that we're walking real, and that it's not fake. I'll end with uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 26. It says, let us draw near with a true heart. Right, we're, not, we're not faking it. Let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Right? We don't have that evil conscience anymore because we know we're doing what's right. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Hold on to that. Don't waver in what you know is right. For he who promised is faithful. And then it says, let us consider one another. And we're not in this alone. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Right? We need each other. As is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. For what? If we sin willfully, if we keep on sinning willfully, we have, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sin. Right, so if we, here's the point, there's no forgiveness without repentance. You can't keep living you can't be forgiven if you will not cease in, from the sin. And so I just pray that each one of us can look at our life and make sure, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What do you need to work on in your own personal life to make sure you're walking in the light? I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to help you turn back to the Bible. Make sure your actions line up. And then I ask you the question, have you been saved in the first place? Here's the five-step plan of salvation. As you hear the Word of God, you hear what you need to do to be saved. Secondly, you must believe it. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the only answer for your sin. Now, John 8, 24, you need to repent of your sins. You can't continue to live in them. Luke 13, 3. And then you confess the name of Christ before men and then be baptized in order to wash your sins away. And at that point, around the line, that's when you enter into salvation for the first time. And then you need to remain faithful until death. And then we'll receive that crown of righteousness, Revelation 2.10. So if anybody needs to be baptized today, we're ready to do that. If anybody needs to repent and is a member of the Lord's church, please do so as we stand and as we sing.